and welcome to Game Changers with Vicki Abelson. And my guest tonight is Willie Ames, teen idol, teen icon. Wow. Oh my God. <laughs> Willie, it's it's so yes, it's so great that you're Willie here Ames. because I've been trying to get you. You know, I was trying to get you to do this while we were still meeting. You were gonna come to my house. It's true. Yeah, and, it's and, true. And do it live. And yeah. So this has been going on for a while and I'm, this is the one thing I'm grateful to COVID for. <laughs> I was able to get you. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad that COVID could bring somebody something. That's right. Other COVID. Oh my God. So let's talk about that first. Cause I, I think, you know, that I lead this band of COVID crazies. How have you and Winnie fared through this pandemic? You know, it's, it's really interesting because Winnie and I were talking about this today, who is my absolutely wonderful wife um oh god I'm gonna talk we, we're gonna oh, oh just like the best part of anything the best part of waking up is winnie right next to you um i love that you you have on your facebook page uh willie ames winnie's husband <laughs> yes well you know you know the, the joke is like so winnie when my my wife is is chinese and her last name is hung and she's been in the industry for a long time, and she's a she's a very accomplished actress, and you know humanitarian, and she's been involved in the union, and she's been a volunteer. But and so for her professional reasons, she did not want to take on my last name oh, when we got married. Okay, and it, which is completely fair and and, sure. and and great. So I decided I would change my name to her last name, which would make me Willie Hung. <laughs> That's hysterical. Because yeah, that would be that would be progressive, wouldn't it? Like it, the man takes on the lady's name. It would be. And so and so, you know, but filling out paperwork, you know, first <laughs> name or last name first, you know, and then. Right. It would really get interesting in, in many, you know, many circles if I changed my last name to Hung. Well, but you couldn't do it because of for, for career reasons, you really couldn't. No, I just, you know, it's just an opportunity to have fun with, you know, with with name changes and that sort of thing. But we are doing for COVID, you know, through COVID, mm -hmm. um, you know, we live in in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, right. So my wife is Canadian, so I moved to Canada, so I would be closer to her. <laughs> and um and we absolutely love the Northwest. I've lived in the Northwest before when I was living in Portland, Oregon. Ah. Um, and I think the thing about being in lockdown for me was, mm -hmm. remember, I, I spent, you know, almost nine years as a cruise director on cruise ship. Which I did not know until we connected my husband, Gabe, and you. And I did not know this about you. So in my world, I would quite often never go, I would go 60, 70 days, never step foot off the ship because my wow. position was, was quite busy. Right. And then my, my, you know, my cabin was, you know, eight feet by 12 feet. Right. So I was used to living in a very confined space and watching right. the world outside. And right. one of the, the, the true tests is it, before Winnie and I got married, she cruised with me for, for quite a few weeks. And we were in this in this little tiny space together for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And we had zero problem. And so I, I often say that, that, you know, being a cruise director prepared me well, not just for all of the other things that I do, but for being in this situation now where our space is limited. You know, I never thought of that, Willie. And, you know, Gabe and my romance started on the cruise ships. I used to cruise with him. And that's where we made Harry, our son. And uh, so I didn't think about we and we were in a we weren't he was not a cruise director. We were in a smaller cabin than you were. But yeah, yeah. we had a ball. But I, I, I we're going to go back to your past. But I just want to talk about Winnie since we're here. And yeah. I, I did not know that you guys had been have this whole history, which I want you to tell us. But I just want to say that watching you guys be in love on Facebook is one of the sweetest things about Facebook because Aww. you really, your adoration for each other, your respect for each other, your like for each other is so clear, comes through so strong. And I respect that, admire it. And I want what you guys are having. So tell us how you and Winnie first connected. Well, uh, for first, uh, let me just still, uh, I'll do that. But I, I have oh, yeah. to comment on, on your comment. Um, I really, truly believe that, you know, like 
sobriety and things that you know, if you want to be successful, you hang out with successful people. Yes. If you don't want to slip, don't go to slippery places. Ah. I think in, in relationships, mm -hmm. I think that we need to stay in practice, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Um, what comes, you know, out of the, out of the abundance of the heart, if you go back to my old ministry days, there's a, there's a, a, a proverb that says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what comes out of your mouth shows what's in your heart, right? And, and I do believe that being in love takes practice, mm. just like everything else, having good relationship skills. And it doesn't mean you get it right. I mean, we completely F this up tons. <laughs> <laughs> which we don't share it with you guys, but we do. And sure. And, but I think, I think for me, at least um, it's important, you know, because I've had people go, you guys are over the top. It disgusts me. You're always <laughs> talking about how much you love each other and you this and that and oh my winning and oh my that. And it's come from people very close to me. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I have to remind them that I don't post that for you. Mm. I post it for me. Ooh. Because I want to keep myself in the habit of thinking of my wife and my relationship in the best possible terms, instead of creating the habit of complaining, Ooh. finding fault, finding chinks in the armor, weaknesses, annoyances. If you focus on those things, those take those things take precedence in your life. This and is so, this is brilliant, Willie. This is so, absolutely brilliant. I just really believe that 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 and and I try to practice again. I I listen. I'm full of contradiction and 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 you know and, and flaws. But I think it's important for me to get up and remember the that I have someone very special in my life. And and we get busy and we do those things. So the reason that I post that much about it. Mm -hmm. is not only do I enjoy it, but I think it builds healthy habits of remembering to see your significant other, you know, your spouse, your whoever, um, in a light that's positive. And I don't believe that I really, I really run from posts and people that I see that become toxic, especially when they're talking about their spouse or their loved one or whoever it might be. It just isn't, it just isn't healthy. There are places to do that. There are healthy places and ways to express that, but out on public, no. So let me tell you my favorite story in the whole wide universe. Oh, please. Okay. Yeah. Back when I was doing Eight is Enough. Right. Um, and I Which was Betty Buckley, who I absolutely adore and have gotten to know on Facebook. Like, I'm so excited with this connection. One of the most <laughs> wonderful people on the planet. Um, gave Betty White a run for her money when it came to being like the most liked, loved person ever. Wow. Betty White, Henry Winkler, oh. you know, Anson Williams, oh, yes. Gregory Harrison. They're all in Which, that. Which, uh, by the way, I just saw people. your your uh, network of the stars. Sorry to interrupt you, but where yeah. you and Gregory and Gregory connected with his then to yeah. become wife and you guys yeah. were on the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And, and he's one of the most kind, loving, lovely people ever. Um, and we've become even closer, you know, in, in recently because he's up in Canada all the night, all the time doing the, the Hallmark movies. But um, so back when I was doing Eight is Enough and I was mm -hmm. also touring with my band and I was, mm -hmm. you know, I was opening up for, you know, all kinds of people. Um, like who? Tell us. Oh, gosh. I mean, we uh, we opened up for for, you know, Sticks one year. We opened wow. up for um, uh, Rod Stewart one year. We wow. opened up for, but I mean, it was like, you know, way, way, way down. And then we would play. We would do like, uh, you know, Space Mountain Theater at Disneyland and lots of, you know, different places. Uh, Tanya Tucker. We opened for Tanya Tucker one year. And, and we, you guys were really good. Too. I mean, I, you know, I, I watched a bunch of videos. So you were like, you were really fantastic. We had a lot of fun. We had a, we had a really, really good time. And, and so anyway, in those days, I was also mm -hmm. doing all of the teen mag stuff when I was, oh, yeah. I, uh, I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just share. Oh it yes, was, please share. It was, it was Ladies, back in get these ready. days. Oh. Yeah, it was it was back when that kind of stuff was happening. And uh, 
And so I was receiving a lot of fan mail. You know, I was re receiving I bet thousands, you were. Of, and thousands of letters a week. <laughs> and I knew, you know, you'd open, I take like open one or two a week or whatever, because you can't open them all, you know, and, and right. I would read them. And there would always be these, you know, these little things like, you know, oh, you know, hi, can I have an autographed picture? And I really love your show. And, and I knew they'd get an autographed picture because you have a service, you sign like a thousand of them, they send them out for you and you know, right. take care of that. But then there would always be this, this little picture of themselves and then a phone number. And they'd say, but like, well, please call me sometime. <laughs> and I started feeling really guilty because, you know, clearly they're writing all the guys on TV, you know, and, and they're writing all of, you know, but, and, you know, well, Willie, you know what, by the way, as one of those girls once upon a time, that's not true. I mean, I wrote Barry Castle. I'm older than you. So you, but I wrote Barry Castle. I wasn't writing everybody. Mickey Dolan's and Barry Castle. That was it for me. <laughs> well, I, I felt guilty. You know, I never assumed that I was the only guy. Right. But, um, <laughs> But I, so I would see the little phone number and I think, well, I know they're going to get their autographed picture, but nobody's ever going to call these girls, you know, and I think, well, screw it, man, I'm going to do it. So I picked out a letter and I saw this letter. One, you picked out one? One letter. Yeah. One letter. One letter. And wow. I said, and I looked at it and I said, I've seen this name before. I've chosen this letter before because it was the old airmail. It was a blue letter, right? Airmail rice paper, right? And I was like, oh, I've I've gotten this girl's letter before. I've chosen this before, so I open it up. Oh, hi, hi, hi. Here's the phone. I went, screw it. I'm going to do it. So I picked up the phone. Hi, this is Willie Ames. I'm calling from Universal Studios. Ah, click. She no, hung, she hung up on me. <laughs> I was like, what, what? So I called back. And I said, you know, hi, uh, this is Willie Ames calling. Don't hang up, you know. And they said, oh, it can't be you. I said, no, it's really me. To wow. prove it, here's what's in your letter. And I just want to thank you for being so kind and sending a letter. And you sent your number. I wanted to reach out to you. And, and you know, and clearly you're very persistent because I've received a few of your letters, you know. And so we had Wait, nice Willie, how old are you and how old is Winnie at this point? Oh, I think uh, she's probably 13. Am I, I'm, I'm, you know, 25. Okay. Um, okay. And so, so, you know, we chatted, she said, can I write you back? I said, sure. Here's my office number. You know, you don't have to go through the studio or the magazines or whatever hung up and we became pen pals for 30 years. That is so crazy. Never met, never flirted with each other, never crossed the line. Then, you know, we'd lose track of each other, then pick it back up. Then there was, then there was email, then there was, you know, and, and we kind of went through all of this and she went on and had her life. And I went on and had my train wreck of a life and all of that <laughs> kind of stuff. And finally, when I was on the ship, I opened up LinkedIn and there was this LinkedIn message that said, hi, you know, remember me? And I'm like, well, of course I remember you, you know, been writing back and forth for 30 years. And she said, I'm just checking in to see how you're doing, blah, blah, blah. And we, we, and we, we started up our, our friendship, strictly platonic friendship. And I said, look, I'm on the ships and the way that we all keep in touch is with Facebook. There, it's just the easiest way. That's what all right. of the ships crews do. And you're going to have to get on Facebook if you want to continue this. And she's like, no, I don't want to be on Facebook. And I said, well, that's the only way we can stay in touch. She said, OK, I'll get on Facebook as long as we don't have any of the same friends. We do not cross <laughs> into each other's world. Like, Fine, you know, go ahead. <clears throat> and so we became very close on the ship. And she would ask me advice on guys. And I would ask her advice on women. And wow. we be, kind of became each other's closest confidants. Like I could talk to her and say things to her and we'd, you know, talk about our families and our friends and what was going on. And we just became extremely close. And she would always tell me, I have never, there, I, there's no good guys to meet in Vancouver. And I'd say, Winnie, I'm sure there's plenty of good guys to meet in Vancouver. She'd say, no, you don't understand. There's no good guy. And I said, Winnie, you're being way too picky, <laughs> way too picky. And, uh, and she'd say, no, I'm not. And I said, I finally got fed up and said, all right, fine. Send me a list of attributes that you think would be the perfect guy. Oh. And I got a list as long as my arm. <laughs> and, I, and I looked at it, but they were all character things. Like it had nothing to do with career or anything else. But what really stood out to me was 
she she thought the man of her dreams would have many female friends that were never conquests wow how interesting and i thought that's really interesting you know and i wrote her back and i said you realize the man you're looking for does not exist like no man can live up to this list this this expectation wait like, can i stop you for a second what why is why did she want to have a man who had a lot of women friends who weren't conquests. What did that mean to her? She wanted to know that the man that she was going to be with knew how to treat women as just good people and not an object or a conquest wow. or a trophy. That, that if they had good female friends that were strictly friends, they were they 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 they, they knew how to 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 just be friends with people, not, you know, not wow. having an agenda. And so, so, you know, I wrote her back and I said, the, the guy that you're looking for doesn't exist. I mean, in fact, you would be the all time nightmare date from hell. <laughs> I would not date you if the sky was purple and horses were green because you're far too picky. And she would say, and I said, you know, you, Winnie, you're, you're, you're in your forties you're gonna end up alone and she would say i don't care i would rather be alone than in some relationship i don't want wow and i don't need to be with anybody i just know that the man i'm looking for is out there i just haven't found him yet and i said look winnie yeah i think he, and she said no i know he's out there and i don't want to be in some lousy relationship that i have to get out of to be with the right person that is meant for me. And I know that that person's out there. And I went, well, good luck to you, you know, cause it ain't gonna happen. And she finally said, hey, you know, do your ships ever come to Vancouver? And I said, well, I, I know we have some that do because they do the Alaska season, but I'm usually right. going from like Tahiti to Venice, mm -hmm. you know, or I'm in South America or I'm saying, you know. Right. She said, well, if your ship ever comes to Vancouver, can we finally meet? I said, sure, you know, of course we can, you know, thinking, you know, nine years, I've never been sent to Vancouver. <laughs> sure enough, I'm filling in for a cruise director that was sick that year. So I had five days off for the entire year. Oh I was doing two back-to-back -back contracts, wow. one contract, five-day break, another contract. It just hor horrendous schedule. But I looked on it and sure as shit, I'm delivering a ship to Vancouver, getting doing one Alaskan cruise, getting off the ship, but then I got to go to LA, repack and fly to Marseille to catch my next ship and start the next contract. So I looked at it and went, holy cow. So I wrote her and I said, hey, you'll never guess, I'm gonna come to Vancouver, but I'm also signing off the ship, which will allow me to give you a tour of the ship if you're available. And I think after 30 years of friendship, I at least owe you dinner. And then I gotta go, cause I gotta get to LA and, and like, you know, I gotta, I gotta go. And right. She, she said, oh, yeah, 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 sure, of course. So at that time, I was chatting with my friend Bonnie Teagle, who used to be the senior producer at Entertainment Tonight. She's passed away. Mm -hmm. And um, and Bonnie, I told Bonnie this story, I said, hey, she started off as a fan. We became pen pals. Now she's a good friend. We're finally going to meet for the first time after 30 years of friendship. And she went, we got to have cameras. <laughs> We got to, no. we got to do a story. And I was like, I don't think so, Bonnie. She's a very private person. Wow. Um, and I don't think, and she said, Willie, I've known you for over 40 years. If you ever want entertainment tonight to cover anything you do in the future, you'll at least ask. Wow. I was like, ah, okay. Now keep in mind, I've been on a ship for months, blah, blah, blah. So I write Winnie. Dear Winnie, see my friend below. She has a request. What would you think if maybe entertain him tonight? It was there, did a story on us. And I got a response. She tore me to shreds. <laughs> she ripped me a new one. How dare you? I thought we were real friends. I am wow. not an opportunity for you to look like a good guy in the press. This wow. is absolutely insulting. I will cherish the, the memories that we had together. But if this is what you want from me, we're not friends. Any like she is just tearing me a new one. Wow. Now, again, I am a senior officer on a ship. 
I take no shit from anyone. <laughs> I've seen some videos of you. I know that to be true. Let alone, <laughs> not the captain, not the GM, let alone some I've never met. And she's questioning my integrity and my character and my motive and my, wow. and I just, I just, I was seething and I was just like, don't write her back. You'll say something stupid. Don't write back. You wow. will, you will, like, I was mad. I was hot and tired, you know, 17 of hours course. a day, seven days a week for five months, you get tired. Sure. So I said nothing. And about four days later, I got another uh, email from her. Well, I guess you're not coming. I said, oh yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> What about the cameras? No cameras. What about dinner? Fine, we'll do dinner. Be at the at the dock at 9 a.m. Fine, fine. I'm like, great. I got five days off for the year, and I'm wasting two of them on somebody that's just turned into a nightmare. <laughs> so the ship gets to Vancouver, and there's five other ships in port, which means there's like 60,000 people in the terminal. Oh, my God. And she's not there. And I'm like, really? I have to turn over an entire ship to another human being. There's paperwork involved. Like you don't just go, here's the keys, have fun. I've got work to do. And that, right. so I was like, maybe she's stuck at security. So I grab my radio and I go stomping down the gangway <laughs> and I'm walking through the terminal. People are going, Hey, you're Willie Ames. I'm like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, and they're going, you're a cruise director. I'm like, yeah, good. <laughs> said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm looking for a visitor. Maybe she's stuck at the at security. You know, I, I, I'm trying to, and they said, you'll get lost in this terminal. If you don't have help, we'll help you find her. What does she look like? Oh, stop. You don't know what she, you've never exchanged. She never sent you a photograph? Well, we've had some, you know, but not, you know, wasn't that kind of thing, right? So, so you know, I mean, like she would have whatever was posted on her profile picture, or whatever. And I, I said, well, she's asian and they, they burst out laughing because you know they're like it's vancouver look around you it's like the largest population of chinese outside of hong kong you know like they're everywhere take your pick <laughs> look around couldn't find her so now i'm really hot now i'm really angry and i go stomping back to the ship and my radio goes off and it's the chief security officer he says hey your guest is on board i was like how the how'd you get past security uh-huh and I said, so I went, yeah, okay. So now I'm stomping up the gangway. Like, <laughs> let's get this over with. I stomp up the gangway and I come around and she's standing there with a smile on her face. And I swear, Vicky, I couldn't breathe. Wow. I couldn't speak. My knees wouldn't work. Oh, wow. I was just stunned. And I, I, I gave her a big hug and I picked her up, you know, and she was like, put me down. Like, she looked at me and she goes, you're acting really weird. I was just staring at her, you know, and, and they said I gave her a tour of the whole ship. Like, I don't remember any of it. I was just staring at her. Wow. And she was like, are you okay? Like, have you been at sea too long? Have you like, not seen a, a woman in a while? You know, like, what's the deal? And I was like, no, I'm just really happy to see you. And she's like, well, do you want to get some coffee? I was like, oh, I could drink coffee for days. You know, I was like, well, do you want to go for a walk? I can walk forever. You know? <laughs> and so I signed off the ship. I went and I checked into my hotel room and she met me, you know, down for coffee we had a coffee and went for some walk for a walk. And as we're walking along the, the boardwalk, the seawall here in Vancouver, she says, would you take a picture with me? So I have something to remember this day by. And I'm thinking you're not going to need it because I ain't going anywhere. Like wow. you are not going to need the picture, but I wanted to impress her. So uh, I said, well, yes, of course, you know, we can have a picture taken. You see those people standing down there? No, don't tell me that was entertainment tonight. Anyway, no, 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 God, no. No, I said, those people are Australians and Australians are friendly and they'll, they'll take our picture. And she went, how do you know they're Australians? I went, cruise director, this. <laughs> oh, excuse me, would you uh, mind taking our picture? Ah, got it, mate, hang on. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, yeah, they were Australians. They're like, see, there you are, Australians. So we took a picture together and I looked at it and I was like, oh my God. And that night, you know, we had dinner, had a lovely time. She went home. I went to my hotel and I posted the picture on Facebook. And my my best friend of 40 years pops up and goes, mate, I've never seen you look like that. 
Aww. in a picture with anyone. Like you guys look like you've always been together. And I went, I know it's weird, isn't it? And then my mother popped up and she said, are you getting married? What? I went, mom, like, I'm writing. I'm going, mom, I just met the girl, you know, it's late. You're old. Go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and she she wrote back she said i was on the set the day you called her and you wow. hung up you hung up the phone and turned to me and said wouldn't it be weird if i ended up with that girl oh come on where and so so i went I, I called her the next day i got up called her the next day and i said hey winnie meet me for breakfast i've got to go to the airport but i want to have breakfast with you we did we had a lovely breakfast you know she was crying so it was lovely to meet you and i said so nice to meet you we had the greatest time ever I flew to Los Angeles and I was at my son's house and I'm repacking, right. To get, to go to France. Mm -hmm. And I stopped and he came in and he goes, what's wrong with you? And I said, I got to go back. And he said, to Canada. I said, yeah, I got, I, I got to go back. And he goes, dad, go, go. So I booked a flight, booked a room, called Winnie and said, I'm coming back to Canada. And she said, but you're going to France. I said, I know what I got to do. Just be at the airport when I get there. And she goes, okay, okay. So I flew up, I came through immigration and I walked up to her and I said, I'm going to marry you. Oh, you're killing me with this story. And she said, she looked at me, Vicky, and she said, I can't. And I said, what? I'm going to marry you. And she goes, you can't. And I said, I, I thought we knew about everything about it. It was like, is there somebody I didn't know about? And she said, no, it's just that no man has ever met my father. And out of respect for him, you're going to have to ask his permission first. And I was like, okay, how's one gray haired guy going to ask another gray? Okay. <laughs> I said, what if he says yes? And she said, I won't give you an answer out of respect for my father, but it'd be favorable. And I said, okay, in the meantime, I'm this is the second day you've, you've seen her in person. I said, in the meantime, I'm going to show you the rest of the world. Here's a ticket to Copenhagen. I want to, I want to show you the rest of the world. Come sail with me. Wow. And so she joined me in Copenhagen and we did. The right then, that, that. We, a few weeks later. Yeah. And, uh, and wow. we sailed all through the Baltics, you know, Germany and, you know, Poland and, you know, Finland and Sweden and Russia and, and we did the, the Mediterranean, you know, and France and Greece and all of that. And, uh, and okay, I have a, an indelicate question for you, but I'm just curious. So she came and met you. Mm -hmm. You are basic straight. You're you know each other for 30 years, but intimately you're kind of strangers. Yep. So how did that work with her being on the ship with you? Like as soon as she got there, how did you handle that? Did you as share a room? Was, were you possible. Okay. Yeah, no, she stayed with me in my cabin, mm -hmm. you know, sailed with me. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think the thing about it is that it was like an old school romance. You know, it's like the courtship. It was like 30 years of courtship, yeah. 30 years of understanding each other, 30 years of, you know, and and we just had the most lovely time. And it's so funny because we we had to set an appointment then, you know, because the whole time we sailed, she was saying, OK, when you meet my family, you could do this, but you can't do that. We're pretty traditional Chinese family. My father was a professor at the university, you know, professor of business studies. My mom, you know, say this, say that you can say this. You can't say that. Don't do this. Don't do that. I'm like, <laughs> Winnie, I got this. I am a five star cruise director. I have yeah. 47 nationalities that work and live with me every day. Right. I deal royalty on board. I can handle this. And she's like, you don't understand. <laughs> Asian family, you're going to need this, 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 like, you know, you know, and, and we finally set the appointment for her fam, for her mom and dad to meet us uh, in Vancouver. And, you know, they, they knew what was coming. So, you know, Winnie and her mom are walking and I'm chatting with her dad and we're walking and the women split off. Right. Cause they know what's coming. Right. <laughs> so I, I turned to her dad and I said, Mr. Hung, uh, I want you to know that I, I adore your daughter and it would mean, and I intend to marry her. It would mean the world to us if we had your approval. And he turned to me and he said, I have just one question. And I said, what's that? And he said, what's your magic? 
what's your magic for 43 years? No man gets past date two. And you wrapped it up in a weekend. Like, what's your magic? Wow. I said, just 30, 30 years of sincerity and friendship. He said, of course you have our, our approval. Aww. And I adore them. I adore them. We, you know, I, I'm, I, I have a little crush on her mom, <laughs> um, you know, and, and cause she's just cute. And then, you know, and then I met her grandmother who's 103 this year. Oh, wow. Um, and just adorable. And she doesn't speak a lick of English. I mean, she has very little English, but she and I, we have a thing, like we, we get it. Right. And, uh, and so, you know, she was, she and I, you know, just love each other and, and, you know, her sister and her dad and her, you know, her cousins were close with her cousins and her, you know, and it, and it, it's really just been lovely and and how uh, are your kids with winnie and her family they adore her they adore her and mm -hmm. you know and and oh, oprah you know that was doing a where are they now thing and and they right. oprah and and her team said it was one of their favorite love stories and then hallmark asked me to write a script about it and uh and i wrote that script and it's been it's been sitting over there. We very nearly made it with them just before COVID, and um, and uh, there's rumor that they may resurrect it. Uh, but uh, oh, anyway. I hope so. What a fabulous love story! Wow. Yeah. So that's it. That's that's it's a very long story, but uh, it's my favorite story in the whole wide universe. So it's a pretty wonderful story, and I I I'll, I am guessing I believe in destiny. I'm guessing that you guys do too. We do. Um, you know, Winnie and I are always, always saying that, that, you know, and, and many others have said the same thing that it mm -hmm. was just, it was destined to happen, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and, um, I consider myself very, very fortunate, you know, with all of the life experience that I've had and I've had mm -hmm. tons, um, you know, I did a show up here that was a, a, a wonderful show. Mm -hmm. um, where they, they sort of uh, reenact your life for you with a bunch of actors. Wow. And it's sort of a radio play mm -hmm. and they take the facts of your life and they play it out in front of you. And then they ask you to comment on how it goes. It's a terrific, terrific idea. And they said, the last thing that they said is, you know, having, having seen your life now on stage, um, what advice would you give the younger you? Mm -hmm. what would you say mm -hmm. about all of that? And I, I said, you know, I would tell my younger self, everything's going to be okay. You end up with a girl. Wow. You know, you end up with a girl in the end. And I did. Um, and I, and I have to say, you know, I've never, you know, with, with, with respect to, to everybody, you know, in, in, in my life, I've never mm -hmm. been happier. Um, you know, she makes me the best me I can be. Well, that's very clear. I mean, it just, it just sparks out of every photograph you guys take together. And in every word you say about each other, it's, it's quite lovely to watch. Yeah, I'm well, so happy for you. Okay. So let's talk about the, the early Willie, young yeah. Willie. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's go back and talk about the young one. So you were a very young actor. I mean, courtship of Eddie's father, all that stuff. How did that break for, how, what, was your mother a stage mother? How did that happen for you? No, 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 no. no. Um, so I'm the youngest of four. Okay. And everybody in my family had their own identity. My sister was, you know, you know, very popular at school and cheerleading and all of that. My oldest brother, Jim, uh, was very athletic and he set lots of records in school. And then wow. my brother, Ron, mm -hmm. my, my second older brother, Ron, was a dead ringer for Tom Selleck in his younger wow. years. Wow. Dead ringer. Uh, when he, when I would go to, go to places together, people were sure it was Tom and, um, and his surfer, wow. you know, and everything else. And then there's me like doing what, you know, nothing. And, nothing. How old were you? Five. What do you mean doing nothing? <laughs> well, you know, eight, nine years old, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I had a teacher with a boyfriend who wanted to become an agent. And he thought if he could get some kids started, mm -hmm. you know, then he could become the agent. And he saw me in school doing little skits and plays and that sort of thing in our, in our class, first, first or second grade or third grade, something like that. And um, it would have been uh, 69. And, um, and so he kept saying, would you like to be on television? And I would go home. My dad was a fireman. My mother was a manicurist. 
they came from a family of academics, college professors and, and biochemists and math teachers. And, and, uh, and I would say, what would you think if I was out, if I was on TV and they'd go, oh yeah, that would be good. Go out and clean up after the dog, you know, and, <laughs> and I come back again and go, well, what would you think if I did something on TV? And they were like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And one day he finally said, I want to take you to meet an agent. And my parents were dead set against it. They were like, absolutely not. You are never going to go in, get anywhere in that business. You'll never get any work. You'll never get an education. So they were half right. Um, and then, and, and then, you know, they, and they said, and plus, you know, we don't like those people anyway. They're all a bunch of blowhards. And I had met uh, an agent by the name of Tony Kelman, who was handling Jodie Foster and uh, some oh, wow. Brady Bunch. And, mm -hmm. you know, she was, there were two it agents for kids. One was, was, uh, uh, Mary, uh, oh, I just went blank. Um, and then Tony Kelman mm -hmm. and uh, Mary Grady. And, um, and I begged my parents and they said, absolutely not. And I said, please. And they said, okay, just so you can never come back to us and point the finger and say, if you had let me try this, I could have done something different with my life. We'll give you three months. Wow. If you can get a job in three months, you can stay with it as long as it's fun. And three yeah. weeks later, I started my, I did my first job, which was a Philip 66 commercial. The week after that, I did uh, a thing uh, called, called the young rebels with David soul. And oh my God, uh, I love David. So how old were you when you, when this first work came that would have been, you? I would have been uh, nine, I think at that point. Unbelievable. And, and oddly enough, Eric Scott, who went on to be on the Waltons was with me that day. We, you know, it was, one of his first jobs, one of my first jobs. Um, and, and we've wow. been lifelong friends as well, but uh, that was the start of it. And I, I just never, I mean, I just kept working and just kept working and kept working. And then I was, you know, working with Henry Fonda doing like the GAF, you know, Viewmaster commercials. And I was Tony Randall's son on the odd couple. And which is we crazy. Doing, yeah. We were doing, <laughs> you know, Court of Everybody's father with Bill Bixby and Brandon Cruz, who was still a good friend. Wow. And uh, we're doing the original Love American style and we were doing Medical Center and we were doing movies of the week. And, you know, and, and so I was really fortunate. I got to hang around like, you know, Lucille Ball and John Wayne oh. and Alfred oh my Hitchcock and, God. and uh, you know. Tell Shirley me about Young. tell me about Lucy now that Being the Ricardos is out there. How, did you watch uh, Being the Ricardos? Have you, <laughs> you seen know, it? I haven't seen it yet. Um, you know, uh, Desi Jr. was very kind to me once. And I. so this was probably around 73, I want to say, when the new Lucy Show incarnation happened. And I, right. I, was, I was able to be there. Um, there was a bunch of shows that were being rebooted. Uh, Andy Griffith had a show being rebooted. She had a show that was sort of being rebooted. And so all of us kids were in those mixes. And I wasn't working on the show, but I did get a chance to meet her. And one of the things that I said to her was uh, I, I said, you know, Miss Ball, you know, can I ask you a question? And she was very stern. She turned around, what is it, young man? I'm like scared the crap out of me, you know? <laughs> and I said, um, can you tell me how you made Lucy believable? Because she does so many unbelievable, crazy. And she said, you stop right there, young man. You stop right there. And I was like, what? And she said, I never allow myself to believe that Lucy's life couldn't happen that way. And if I believe it, the audience will believe it. Wow. Perfect. Perfect. And it changed my life. Wow. Because not from just an acting perspective, but I've approached the, my entire life that way now. How Why so, can't really? my life go that way? Why couldn't I do those things? I never allowed myself to believe that my life couldn't go that way. Wow. Which is how I became a master diver and over the great whites and how I worked at Marineland and rode killer whales and dolphins and how I ended up winning the world's richest Marlin tournament, you know, and how I ended up doing survival wow. stuff in the Yukon and how I ended up becoming a, you know, a, a children's pastor and how I ended up becoming a cruise director and all of those things in my life, it taught me that I wanted to be the guy that didn't just talk about the things he would do. You know, I raced off shore boats. I raced cars. I raced off road cars. I won tournaments. I won, you know, um, it was always with that spirit that I got from her. 
that was never allow yourself to believe that your life can't go that way or be too stupid to know that you can't, I guess, is what you, you know. So now, Willie, when you hit hard times, which there's a lot of stuff in there I want to do in between, but yeah. when you hit hard times, did you maintain that belief that no. you were good? Okay. No. Um, you know, the hard times are, you're not faultless in anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not one to, to, to blame uh, anybody from, from my mistakes or my, or whatever happened. Mm -hmm. I, I believe in responsibility and I took full responsibility for all of it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I can't control what other people do say or think I can only control my actions. And, oh yeah. And by not, uh, the, I, I don't need to spread blame. I had, I made my choices. I'm a big boy and I knew better. Um, you know, and, and, and my parents were better than that. And society was better than that. And if my parents and my family wasn't good enough, there's plenty of example around me in this world to show you what the right thing to do is. Um, eight is enough. The Brady Bunch, you know, just look at it. There's examples there. Um, but when I finally got to the point where I was 13 years ago, mm -hmm. which was sleeping in the bushes at the Hollywood Bowl, um, broke, bankrupt. Uh, my former spouse had left. My children weren't speaking to me. I had zero money. Uh, I had no house to live in. I had no job. I had no car. I had no nothing. Um, it was one of the few times in my life that I very nearly gave up completely. And I, I will never forget lying in, in, I was sleeping in a duffel bag in the bushes. Off of how, how long was this period of, of, of bottom for you, Willie? Months. 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 It had it, been building. It had mm. been, you know, the bottom was probably years long, mm. but, but the final consequence of, mm. okay, you know, was, was more, you know, was more months long. Um, and it's very blurry. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of very, there was a lot of very emotional, very, you know, a lot of stuff going on. Um, but I do remember, uh, trying to get warm in this duffel bag, sleeping outside in the bushes and thinking, is this how Willie Ames is going to end up? Wow. And thinking to myself, I have nothing. I'm 47 years old. I'm not a husband anymore. I'm not a businessman anymore. I'm not a producer anymore. I'm not a director anymore. I'm not a celebrity anymore. I'm not a father anymore. What the hell am I? And I remember thinking, no, no, this isn't how I'm going to end up. I have a choice. I made choices that got me here. I can make choices that will get me out. And I have my brains. I had nothing else, but I had my brains. And what was left of them anyway. And, um, and I just decided that I would go back to those principles. I would take it one minute at a time, one hour at a time, one day at a time. Had you been sober prior to this? Had I you had, yeah. Yeah, you I had. had. Mm -hmm. and, and those tools that you learn mm -hmm. um, are very valuable. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them were learned coping mechanisms on my own. Some mm -hmm. were taught, some were, you know, sort of impugned or imparted to me. Um, and I really had to create a narrative for myself that made sense. And so to a certain extent, when I talk to, when I speak to people who are starting over and there's a lot of people doing it through COVID and there's a lot of people doing it through, mm -hmm. you know, the economy and, and, and those kinds of things. And we clearly here everywhere, uh, Vancouver, LA, there's a lot of homeless, there's a lot of disparity. And one thing that I do know is that if you choose to, you can make your life different, but it's a choice. And I'll never forget making that choice and thinking, I am going to utilize, I used to do 
you know, write some survival skills and that sort of thing for the wilderness. I'm going to use the, the, the five survival skills that I learned in the wilderness to bring myself out of the urban wilderness. And that's what I did. Well, so did you have every, a spiritual awakening, Willie? Was there a moment of clarity that you had? You know, not really. Um, I, I think I think if there was I think if there was a moment of clarity, it was choosing to not end up that way. Like whatever it takes, I am not ending up here. How much of what I saw on on YouTube is real about Serrano? Did was that a real thing or was that a setup for a television show? No, that was a, you know, it, that, that's a, it's an interesting thing about that. And it's, and it's one of the, it is both one of the turning points for the better and one of the darkest moments I ever had. How so? Well, so what happened was when I decided to pick myself up out of the, the bushes, mm -hmm. I actually uh, made a phone call to a guy mm -hmm. that I had met once. Mm -hmm. And his name is Mark. And I said, uh, I was living in Kansas at the time. And I said, uh, my house was in foreclosure and everybody was gone. And I said, can you pick me up at the airport if I can get there? I was in LA when I was in the bushes. And I, I bummed a, an air, a one way ticket back to Kansas City. And he said, you don't sound good. And I said, I ain't good. And he goes, yeah, I'll pick you up. And he showed up at the airport. I got to Kansas City. It was in the middle of the night late at night, like the last flight in. And he had a bag of food for me. And he said, I brought you this because you didn't sound good. And I said, thanks. I barely remember the ride home. And he dropped me off in front of what was still my house, but very quickly going into foreclosure. And I had built that house with my own two hands, much of it. Wow. And so I went and cut the locks off and hot wired it, broke into my own home turned all of the lights and everything else, got it, you know, hot wire, got the gas going, got the, you know, and I had been, uh, I, I was really big on fishing and, and outdoor life and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And it was 19 degrees inside the house. Oh. It had been sitting. And because it was that cold, none of the game meats or fish that I had in the freezer had frozen, had, had thawed. They were still good. And so I started cooking that food in the fireplace and squatting in my own home. Wow. And, uh, and I went and borrowed a friend's laptop and started looking for jobs. And at first thing I did was I started looking for roommates, short-term roommates, cash only. And two guys showed up and said, hey, we're looking for a place. We want to use the room. So I let him in. Now I had some cash, uh -huh. had, you know, about 1200 bucks cash got the utilities turned on, did those kinds of things. And I started looking for a gig, any gig, any gig. And so I looked on online on this friend's laptop and Dish Network was hiring technicians. And if you could pass the test, they had their own vans and, you know, and I was like, I'll take anything. So I went to Dish Network and I walked in and they went, you're Willie Ames. And I said, yeah. And they said, what are you here for? And I said, I'm here to apply for the job as a technician. And they said, um, well, there's been a lot of bad publicity about you lately. And I said, yeah, I know. And they said, we'll take the test. Well, because I wired how many recording studios and editing suites and, everything, you know, it was no problem. They went, wow, you're really good. You're really good with your hands and you really know how to, how to you know, use tools. And I said, yeah. And he said, but we can't hire you. And I said, why not? And he said, because you're too famous. And I said, yeah, but I'm underfinanced. And, <laughs> and they said, but with all of your bad publicity, with your bankruptcy and everything, mm. um, if somebody accuses you of something or some lady exposes herself to you or whatever, yeah. you're going to be a target. Mm -hmm. And we can't hire you. We have to get special permission from Denver to hire you. And Wow. And there are people, you know, I've never been arrested. You know, I mean, I, I like I have no record and and yet I can't get hired for fear. And so they got special permission for me to to install Dish Network. And I became a pretty damn good technician. And people would say, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm here to, to you know, I'm here to install your system. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that time, a friend of mine from VH1, a guy named Jim Ackerman, 
called me and he said, hey, we read about your bankruptcy. We're doing an in-house demonstration film. It'll never see the light of day of called Broken Famous. And what we'll try to do is hook celebrities up with life coaches and transition them into a life outside of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Would you be our in-house demonstration guy and and we'll do a demo a kind of a sizzle reel demo thing and we'll pay you 25 grand and i went deal and he goes you may not like it i said i don't care deal so they they brought this serrano kelly guy in and i was hip to him like like, okay, how much know. how much of it was staged, Willie? How much of it was real? And well, you know, a, a big portion of it was staged, um, you know, like the looking for this and it's reality. It's a reality show. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's all set up. Mm -hmm. But what wasn't set up was one day we were in the basement of this house that's being foreclosed on. And they're doing these wraparound interviews with me, these OTF on the fly things with mm -hmm. me. And I'm, you know, I've been shooting video and, and, you know, I've been a writer, producer, director for 40 years. Right. You know, I mean, I, I, I understand shooting ratios. Like you've got way more footage than you could ever use for a demo. <laughs> and, and I'm going, this is going on hour after hour after hour. And they're like, no, you need to stay here. No, you need to stay here. And suddenly the producer, yeah. now this is what's being produced by Relativity. Reality, relativity, which they were doing extreme home makeover and they were doing, you know, they mm -hmm. had this history in doing this sort of, you know, transforming lives thing. And the producer comes over to me and he hands me the phone and he says, you're on the radio in 10 seconds. And I said, for what? And he said, well, you need money and we're throwing a garage sale. And I went, stop, stop. I don't have legal permission to just sell whatever's in this house i'm going through a divorce i'm right there are attorneys involved in there and and there are things in the house that you don't know the value of and you and i ran upstairs and they had the time that they kept me down there for hours they had had a team empty my house in the front yard wow and i looked out my front door and there were a thousand people in my front yard and five news crews <laughs> And I am freaking the F out because I'm going, oh, my whole house has been emptied into the front yard. There's thousands of people. Unfortunately, my daughter drove by and saw it. And it nearly irreparably harmed our relationship. And mm -hmm. all I could think of is if I freak out on camera, they'll have footage of me freaking out on camera. Yeah. If I call the police, they'll have footage of me calling the police. You've got to redeem this, but you've got to redeem this some other way. But not now. Now is not the time, because if you pitch a fit, what's going to happen is the media is going to say, Willie Ames didn't get enough money for his shit and he's pissed off. <laughs> That's literally what's going to happen. Right. I mean, I'm smart enough to know, but they completely blindsided me. They didn't take a list of what they put in the, in the front yard. They didn't know they didn't have it appraised or valued. They didn't like, for instance, Universal Studios gave me a, a Tiffany clock that said, you know, uh, Willie, thank you for 122 episodes of laughter on Charles in Charge, your friends at Universal TV. Disappeared. I have no idea where it went. Oh, as wow. a clock, it's probably worth a couple grand, but as a piece of memorabilia. Of course. Else, um, I won the world's richest Marlin tournament in 1990. I spent 21 and a half hours fighting this fish and, and, and won the tournament. And there was a reel that they presented me with as part of the trophy. As a reel, it's probably worth six, seven thousand dollars. Disappeared. I have no idea where it went. Um, at the end of the day, they came up. Everybody left. The house was torn to shreds, and they handed me four thousand dollars and said, "Here's your money." This is a five thousand square foot home, and it's shredded. And they said, "Okay, it's drop and walk. That's a wrap." And they they wrapped and they left. And I sat in that living room and I wept all night. And oh. I thought, how do I do this? What do I do with this? And, you know, there's, you know, all of my memorabilia, Vicki, I don't have any memorabilia from my entire career. It's all. And how did you justify it to your, to your soon to be ex-wife? Well, that's a good question. Um, she had 
apparently uh, decided that uh, she, you know, she had already taken much of what she'd wanted, and mm. that what was left was inconsequential to her. Uh, is my assumption. I've never really asked anybody about it. To be they honest. they didn't run it by her before they did that to you. No, no. no. Mm -hmm. And they didn't run it by me. Yeah. And so the next day, I called them in and I said, um, "You've." now outed me nationwide it was the number one entertainment news story of the month. wait a minute i thought that they didn't they weren't going to air this they invited the news crews to my front yard wow so they outed me nationally i had wow. nothing to do with that it was not my decision wow. it was not my choice nothing to do with it to do wow. with it. and i said you know i could put values on things I could try to sue you. Who's going to sue Viacom? Yeah. I've, 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 I got what, whatever money you hand me, there'll be lawsuits flying. I'll get squashed like a bug. Right. You owe me as far as I can tell replacement value on this, 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 and this to at least raise that up to about 10 grand. And they paid it. Um, and then that was it. They finished the whole show and they went, holy cow. Uh, this footage is amazing, but guess what? Um, no celebrity is ever going to let us do that to them again. So the show is done. Sorry, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, you know, and 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 you know, we're not going to pick it up, and we're not going to make it happen after the damage is done, which is reality television for you, right? Mm -hmm. And so while I was sitting there, I kept thinking, how do I redeem this? How do I redeem any of this? It's all my own fault. I said, yes, I signed the damn contract. Um, and then I thought, you know, I think if I learn my lesson, mm -hmm. I think I know the American people well enough to know that they'll forgive me if I actually truly humbly learn my lesson. And so I called a guy that I met during that show, who mm -hmm. was one of the financial people that was going to teach me about finances, which why I was brought to my knees in bankruptcy and everything else. And I called him, I said, Hey, I need to have lunch with you. And he said, for what? And I said, I need to learn my lesson. And he said, how? And I said, I need to become a licensed financial advisor. And he said, you, you, you what? After what I just saw on the news, I said, he said, nobody's going to trust you with their money. <laughs> And I said, I don't want them to trust me with their money. I want to be your poster boy for why they need a good financial advisor. But I have to understand what it is I'm talking about. And he went, yeah, good luck. If you can pass the test, come see me. So I took the money from VH1. They gave, you the, they gave you the 25,000 plus 25, the 10,000 or whatever. 10, yeah. uh -huh. Paid the taxes on it, took the money, got an apartment, got the books, studied for four months, took all of the exams, my series seven, my 13 and, 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 uh, and everything and passed and became wow. a licensed financial advisor. And then VH1 heard about it and went, oh my God, we never could have imagined a better, you know, ending for this. And, uh, and, you know, they said, can we, can we use this as the ending? And I said, sure. And then it was all over the Today Show and Willie Ames goes from, you know, financial ruin to financial advisor. And the guy that I went to to get the job, you know, mm -hmm. we did the Today Show together and everything. And I said, well, OK, I'm ready. I'm, I will travel city to city. I want to do financial literacy seminars in high schools because we need wow. to have a reason for the people. You know, we we talk about everything these days. We talk about sex. We talk about drugs. We talk about trans. We talk about, but we don't talk about money. Nobody teaches the basics of finance in so school true. anymore. Mm -hmm. I can be that guy. I have the credibility. I've made millions. I've lost millions. I've been homeless. I've had to start over. I can be your guy. And I want to go to the Screen Actors Guild and I want to make it compulsory that any child starting any show at any time must for each season do a three day financial literacy seminar. Wow. So that they all understand exactly the basics of finance. And if you are a professional athlete or expecting to be, you must also take this. We can go to Congress with this. We can wow. really make this financial literacy thing a, a real positive. And he looked at me and he said, yeah, 
Yeah, we kind of want you to eat what you kill here. We're not going to put you on to do that poster boy thing. And I went, you know how I ended up broke? By doing stupid shit like this. I just spent five months and all of my money with this expectation that I was going to do this thing, learn my lesson, redeem right. myself, redeem my, you know, my mistakes, help other people in the process and do all of this. And it turns out that you want me to be a mutual funds pimp, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and I, and believe I'm not, uh, I, listen, I'm in the financial services and dealing with it today. I appreciate people who are in mutual funds and financial right. and insurance and all that. I, I applaud you. We need more of you. But this particular deal was, was not what I had expected. And at that time, mm -hmm. as I'm sitting in this office and they're saying, you know, we're going to make you eat what you kill. Um, I received another phone call from a guy that said, you know, that was a financial advisor. And he said, hey, I don't think you're going to do well as a financial advisor. I don't think you have the personality for it. I said, you're right. He said, but I do think you would be really good working on cruise ships. Have you ever considered working on a ship? And I said, well, I've done everything else. <laughs> I mean, literally dive boats, ships, construction, dish network, you name it. I've done it. He goes, I'm going to have a friend call you. So I received a phone call from a guy named Michael Day. And he said, I know who you are. I'm not looking for anybody for the ships. There's no jobs available besides you're from TV. People from TV t tend to be introverts, not extroverts. Huh. Um, and I'm just returning a call for a friend. And I was like, all right, fair enough. You know, thanks for the call. Click. Well, four weeks later, he calls me back and he says, um, something's opened up. Are you interested in being on the ship anymore? And I'm looking in the office of financial advisors and I'm thinking, you people chose this. Yeah, I'm interested. And he said, can you be in St. Lucia in the morning? Wow. And I looked at the snow on the ground in Kansas and I went, yeah, I could be in St. Lucia in the morning. And he goes, all right, I'm sending you a ticket. You're going to join the ship. And I said, OK. So I packed up everything in my office that night. I split. I've never been back since. And I got on a wow. plane and I went to St. Lucia and I arrived at the ship and I said, so what am I going to do? And they said, you're going to be cruise staff. And I said, really? That sounds intriguing. What do I do? <laughs> and they said, you're going to be the ping pong boy and the shuffleboard guy. And you're going to direct people to the toilets and you're going <laughs> to greet them at the restaurants and you're going to clean the, the, the library. It was entry level. And I said, thank you. I will be the best crew staff member I can be. Wow. And I, you know, and I'd be cleaning the library and people would be going, are you the librarian? And I'd say, well, yeah. And they'd wait a minute, you're famous. And I'd go, well, yes, I am. And they'd say, well, you know, what are you doing here? And I'd say, I'm here for you, ma'am. Or I'm here for you, sir. How can I help you? Wow. And about three weeks, four weeks after that, they called me and they said, people seem to like having you around and you're working your ass off. And I said, yes, sir, if you give me an opportunity, I will not waste it. I can promise you, you will not, I will not waste this opportunity if you give me this opportunity. And he said, would you like to do a few more months? And I said, yes, sir, I would. And he said, okay, you're on. Would you like to become an assistant cruise director? And I said, I have no idea what they do. <laughs> I said, we can train you if you're willing to work at it. And I said, yes, sir, I'll do that. And I did my first contract as a, an assistant cruise director and about six months later, he said, we're going to make you a cruise director. And I said, oh, no, you're not. And he said, why not? And I said, because there are a lot of people that have been waiting for that job. Mm -hmm. And normally it takes years of experience leading up to it before you do that. And he said, well, let me put it this way. It's our way or the gang way. Wow. And I said, I guess I'm going to be your next cruise director. And uh, that's what happened. Wow. Wow. So a lot. Just, I'm sorry. I'm so long winded. I'm, you know. No, no, no. I mean, it's all fascinating. All right. So let, so, so you're doing, t let's go back. So you're doing TV. You're a little kid. You're nine, you're 10. How do you get this break to now get a, a recurring role and 
become a television star? How does that, how does that opportunity happen? It's, you know, it's like everybody else. I mean, it's much harder for people today. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, in, in, in those days, in the, you know, in the, the late sixties, early seventies, mm-hmm. there was a small group of us, you know, that, that were always on auditions together, Johnny Whitaker, Jody Foster. You Do you know, know Paul Peterson? I, because oh, I know he, so did he, was he one of the, did he come to your rescue when you were struggling? No, he no, didn't. he did not. Um, and not that he should have. Paul and I are good friends and he's a dear, dear man. And, mm-hmm. and in fact, after I became a licensed financial advisor, Paul was one of the people that were going to help me go to the Screen Actors Guild to create this program, which I would still love to teach, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, I would still like to be that advocate to teach people about financial literacy, especially mm-hmm. for those that are, that are on television shows. And it was, you know, it was, it never happened because the job was never officially given to me. Right. But Paul and I remain friends today. But why didn't Paul, you know, Paul was in the living room and talked to us about going in to help young actors. And he started that whole thing. Why didn't he come to your rescue? Do you know why? Was there a reason? I don't think he had a way of contacting me really. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we had, we had met many, many times, you know, Mm -hmm. before, because it is a small group. Um, and I, I just, I don't think, I, I don't know that he was even aware of it really, maybe, mm-hmm. you know, maybe by, by news stories, mm-hmm. but by that time too, you know, Vicky, I'm not one that really screams, you know, somebody please help. Right. Um, I, I have a tendency to sort of be a little more stoic and say, look, I, I will, I, I know what the right answer is. And I am, I have been gifted by my, my family with a very strong work ethic, like an extremely strong work ethic. And in between, you know, when we were doing Charles in Charge, we would work three weeks and we'd take a week off. Mm-hmm. On that week off, I ran a framing crew. Wow. I didn't, I, you know, I, I would, I, to me, hard work was a, a, a matter of, of course, um, well, this between, is a disconnect because now I want to know, I've, I've asked you one question, but so how did the bottom fall out? So if this is your work ethic and this is what you do, was it drug, drugs and alcohol that took you down? How did you go from having this great work ethic and doing all of this to being well, homeless? So, so when I, there was a, a, about a eight to 10 year period where I, after I, after I left Charles in charge, I couldn't get arrested. I was on television six nights a week. I had why, five shows. Why was that, Willie? Well, when you have five shows in syndication, so Swiss Family Robinson, Eight is Enough, Charles in Charge, you know, uh, and, and and you know Dungeons and Dragons, and Wait Till Your Father Gets Home, and all of these shows are running on different channels. You're on TV six oh. nights a week, seven nights a week. Charles in Charge was on six nights a week at that point. Right. They have enough of you. I mean, I had a baby face. I looked. I played eighteen from the time I was seventeen until I was 33, <laughs> you know, so you, you, you haven't really changed. And they would say, well, we love you. You're a nice guy. Have enough of you. So getting a gig was next to impossible. So mm. I actually, um, at that point, there was a writer's strike mm-hmm. and I, I met up with some people that were doing a thing on the world's richest Marlin tournament. Mm-hmm. And I entered the tournament, won the tournament, but I also produced a, a sports special about it. And the person, a, a person in Kansas City saw the sports special, said that it was one of the best television fishing shows I'd ever seen. I run a fishing show. Would you come to Kansas and, and work with me on a fishing show? Mm-hmm. I thought, oh, I'm in heaven, you know. So I went to Kansas City. It reminded me of Irvine a lot, you know, like Orange County when it was mm-hmm. nice. Mm-hmm. And I moved there and realized that there was a lot of production there. There was lots of corporate video. Sprint, uh, Sprint's headquarters are there. Northwest Airlines uh, was doing their stuff out of there. Merck and, well, actually Marion Pharmaceuticals, which I think rolled into Merck, AMC Theaters, H&R Block, um, you know, there was a Walmart. All of these mm-hmm. things were, were being shot in Kansas City. And I became a, a very accomplished corporate communications director and writer, producer, director, shooter. And then at that time, uh, about that time, I was approached by a company to do start a new company called Pamplin Communications, Pamplin Entertainment, which would do direct sell-through uh, videos to Walmart and, and, and you know, the sell-through market, whether mm-hmm. Toys R Us or Walmart or whatever. Mm-hmm. 
and it was all faith-based. And at that time I, I, you know, was very involved in, in, you know, as a Christian in the church. And so they approached me about being Bible man, you know, and I was like, Hey, yeah, <laughs> what's he do fight Quran man, you know, and, <laughs> you know, I was like, you know, you know, and it, it was something that I really did not want to do. Huh. Um, but I figured it was the most uncomfortable thing in the world. Therefore, um, you know, uh, God probably wanted me to do that. And so I said, yes. And, uh, and that started a company that became uh, 25 bookstores, 12 newspapers, four radio stations, three record labels. Wow. Um, inside sales, outside sales. We had uh, full production, full production studio, full edit suites, graphic suites. And we were doing tons and tons of production mm -hmm. around 2002, I want to say 2001, 2002. Uh, one of our labels, you know, I was became the senior vice president there. And, and one of our labels uh, signed this girl named Katie Hudson to her first record deal. Uh, you'd know her as Katy Perry today. Hello. And uh, Katie was, you know, she was a little 16 year old kid uh, and lovely, absolutely lovely. And, and uh, you know, when she was on, on one of our labels there and I did that for a number of years and towards the end of that run, um, I, I want to be careful what I say, because I, I signed an NDA, mm -hmm. um, but there was some trouble within and I refused to turn my head and look the other way. And I reported the trouble and it led to the downfall of the entire company. Wow. And I refused to look the other way and I had death threats and everything else. And mm. about that time I was on the road touring with the Bible man show. We used to do about 120 dates a year and, and, and tour and you know, the work ethic, I used to drive the truck, you know, I used to load the gear in and we, you know, we'd fill 10,000 seats. So it was, Wow. It was a huge production, you know, mm -hmm. we had, you know, 30 by 40 foot stage, two, two stories, moving lights, full color laser system, lot, largest full color laser system in the country. It was quite a big production. And during that period of time, I blew out the C5 disc in my neck. And for about a year, I couldn't move my right arm and I wow. could barely feed myself because the nerves in my spinal cord were pinched in, between the disc. And it was just constant pain. And so they put me on pain management and uh, they put me on this thing that I'd never heard of before called Oxycontin. Oh my God. Did you, did you watch that, that show with Michael Keaton? Um, about no, I had, I hadn't seen it. I haven't seen it. But dope, it was, dope sick. It's amazing. You should watch it. And, yeah. And, and so I spent two years on Oxycontin while I battled to get my ooh. spinal surgery. And so I was on, on, you know, pain management be, mm. uh, because you needed it. Right. Um, and I finally ended up having my spinal surgery, but in order to clip out the disc between uh, the, 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 the uh, spacer between my discs mm -hmm. that had ruptured, they usually go through your neck, mm -hmm. but because I've made so much of a career with my voice, they were afraid if they did that, it would change that. So they drilled through my spine to get to it. And then they told me that I would probably never lift more than 14 to 18 pounds again in my life. And I would have to do all of this stuff. And, and I remained on, on, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, disability and pain management for almost three and a half, four years straight. Oh, wow. I don't remember most of it. Um, and then I finally transitioned from Oxycontin and uh, Vicodin to Tramadol. And one day I, I, again, you know, uh, I woke up and I went, you know, I started researching this and re and really watching the progression of people online and the blogs that were saying, you know, my, my spouse or my husband or whatever started off as just needing pain management. Then they became 25% disability. Then it became 50% disability. Then it was full disability. Now they're not even the same person that we remember. And they were mm. just sort of lazily floating down that pain management river, which I'm not judging anyone else. I'm just saying that, you know, mm -hmm. um, things can be overprescribed. And, and uh, I woke up one day and I just decided it wasn't going to happen for me. So I, I uh, shut the door, locked myself in the room for about 17 days and went cold turkey. Wow. 
And, uh, and that was sort of like, you know, and, but through that period of time, uh, and there were a lot of other things that were happening, but I wasn't working. And, oh, by the way, we're creeping up on, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the 2008 collapse of everything. And I was certainly in no state of mind to get work. And, uh, and that's just sort of like the, the broad strokes of, were of, you still married that when you were going through this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that was sort of the, the, the decline. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, and like I said, there's, I mean, there's, there's huge, I don't know whether for, uh, uh sort of psychological self-protection reasons, I don't remember a lot or whether it was just the combination of, you know, of, of medications and, and, uh, you know, that was on antidepressants and three different antidepressants and, you know, sleeping pills and clonazepam and tramadol and patches and, you know, mm -hmm. you know, all of these different things. And, um, and, you know, and, and, and that was sort of like the decline into, okay, now you haven't worked. It's 2008. Nobody's hiring anybody. You know, it's the worst economy since the great depression you're in no shape anyway. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I just went, I'm not doing, I'm never living that way again. And, uh, and so I, I, I went cold Turkey and, um, and then there was a period of time, uh, in when I was sleeping in the bushes where I just, I ended up going cold Turkey off of the, uh, the antidepressants as well, which wow. I don't recommend to anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, I don't recommend my, my methods to anybody, uh, quite frankly, but were you getting any, you weren't getting any, you weren't doing any meetings. You weren't going, you weren't doing any sobriety stuff. No, mm -mm. no, it was all up here. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, but you had been through that stuff prior. You, yeah, you knew, yeah, you yeah. knew it was there. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I knew it was there for sure. I knew mm -hmm. it was there. And, and, and why the did lessons... you choose not to to go back there, Willie. You know, I think one of the choices that I made, um, I, I think, I think part of it, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. It's hard to pick mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. but I had already been given the tools and, and the great thing. And what I was starting to say, you know, you and I had a conversation once before about mm -hmm. the tools that you learn when you go through those those steps, the 12 mm -hmm. steps, or, or whether it's a big book or 12 steps, or the, there's some universal truths there mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, the fearless, you know, this inventory and, mm -hmm. and, you know, waking up each day and finding gratitude and putting one step in, you know, uh, having an attitude of gratitude and all that, you know, all of those sort of those things. Mm -hmm. um, part of it was shame. I mean, I, I, sure. I have to say, you know, somebody asked me one time, what was the hardest part of going through everything you've ever been through. And I said, it's the shame. Mm -hmm. It is. It, and I, and I say it often, unless you've truly experienced shame, mm -hmm. I mean, shame that's so debilitating that when you're laying, you're literally laying on the floor in so much emotional pain, mm -hmm. you don't think you can get up again. You've been kicked so hard that it is really questionable as to whether or not you're going to take your next breath. I understand mm -hmm. that shame. Mm -hmm. I understand that kind of pain. Mm -hmm. Um, I understand that, you know, that, that need. And I, and I think, so part of it was ego, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, is a killer. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think part of it was just knowing that I've got the tools and it wouldn't make any difference where you went. If you're not using the tools, you're not using the tools. And so, you know, you can go to, you know, you go to, you can go to a meeting every day for the rest of your life, but if you're not using the tools, you're absolutely. Not so there's all of these life lessons. And I'm, I, I, if I learned anything, it's, it's introspect and self-evaluation and learning to sort of sort through um, what's real and what's not and be honest, really brutally honest with myself, which is why I don't blame anybody else. I don't hold any ill will against anyone. I, I, I only try to take responsibility for what I can control. How did you get into financial? Like, okay, so you're you're having all the success. Eight is enough. Charles in charge. You're having all Bible. You you're having all the success. Where was there a grandiosity? You were obviously living beyond your means, I assume. 
Um, well, here's so here's the here's the sort of insidious part about uh, about our society, right? Mm -hmm. We celebrate the baller life, right? I mean, if you look on TikTok, Instagram, everybody's got a Ferrari, everybody's a baller, <laughs> everybody's got you know, everybody's living the life, right? And right, and you know, living la, la vida loca, you know, in in, in <laughs> essence, and. And everybody's a Kardashian and everybody's an influencer and everybody's got this and everybody's got that. Um, when you look at my life and people say, well, you must have just really fucked this up. You know, can I say that on this show? You certainly can. Because um, I really have horrible language. Um, so do I. So, this is what I love about you. <laughs> um, the the easy answer to the world is, and one of the reasons why I never lashed out at anybody, the easy answer is you lived above your means. You absolutely were stupid with money. You made stupid choices. Look at what a nitwit you are. They're all alike. And to an extent, they're right to a large extent, but there's this other side of it. So when I was at my height, I'm doing well, yes. Yeah, tell us what that looked like. So you're getting, you're yeah. making all this money. So what does your life look like? That is. So you're you're showing up at the set every day at five thirty a.m. You're working mm -hmm. until that evening. You go home. You rehearse with your band. You you get your rehearsal out of the way, and you do that five five days a week. On Friday night, you fly out. You play two different cities. Friday, Saturday, you fly home on Sunday. You do interviews on your breaks. You're doing talk shows in the evenings. You're doing, you know, magazine shoots. You're go, 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 go. But go. you're also ka-ching, 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 right? Well, so, so let's look at, let's just break it down to mm -hmm. the basic expenditures. 10% mm -hmm. to an agent. Right. 15% to a manager. 5% to a business manager, 33.5% to the government paid in advance. What have you got left? You're paying in advance to the government? You're self-employed. Mm. So in 1980, mm -hmm. when I was making a million six a year, mm -hmm. the marginal tax rate under the Carter administration and, and the inflation that we had was 84%. Wow. So as an 18 year old kid, you don't realize that that publicist that's costing you $5,000 a month or $7,500 a month, depending on who they are, that manager that's taken 15% off the top, that business manager that's taken 5% off the top, the government that's and the state, oh, yeah, that's yeah. federal. Then you got to go to the state. So but you may have made a million six, but you probably realized somewhere around 300,000. And oh, by the way, you're expected to look this way, this way, this way, this right. way. And you know you're making big money, but nobody explains the big picture. Nobody understand, nobody, it's not in anyone's, and it's not that they're bad people. Mm -hmm. It's just that you don't really, do you need a manager or could you do with an assistant? You know, do you really need the publicist? And then you don't plan for things like, oh, there's a writer strike. You mean my top 10 hit show is now no longer on the air? Right. It's done. And we're going to replace it with a reality show that is unscripted, where we don't need union actors mm -hmm. or union directors or anything else. Right, right, right. So you don't plan for those things. Mm -hmm. Nobody's planning for those things. Now, some did. I have to say, you know, I mean, you know, Brooke Shields' mom, you know, Jodie Foster's mom, there are, you know, Ron Howard. I mean, there were, there are, there are plenty. Did you have there. guidance from your parents at all, Willie? I had ethical work integrity guidance, but money wise, no. Uh huh. We don't teach our children's finance, we don't, don't teach them the basics. We give them a credit card so that they could see that. Ooh, you can transfer funds to your credit card if you work hard enough. But what people don't teach, what you never learn is, hey, if you've got a credit card, guess what? There's a real life person on the other end of that loaning you money. And if you default on that card, they're not going to eat or their retirement's gone. We don't teach those concepts. These are the things that I wanted to teach. And when I became a financial advisor, <clears throat> excuse me, and I was reading the list of, of, uh, of of rules and regulations mm -hmm. i realized that those were written on my back mm -hmm. in 1980 i was put in by my business manager into a tax shelter 
that was a coal mine. It was a limited partnership. Mm-hmm. And the deal was, is if you paid $46,000, you could take a $500,000 write-off because the rest was a note and you would be able to write off $500,000 from your taxes. And he's, oh, all of our clients are in it. Well, that was in 1980. In 1984, mm-hmm. Ronald Reagan comes into power and he says, okay, we're going we're gonna to disallow all of this mm-hmm. and we're going to make it retroactive. And so now the IRS is coming back for you for taxes and the limited partnership says, ship says, we're going to fight this in court. And I go, I'm out. You're going to lose. Then you're on your own. So I go to the IRS and I say, hey, guess what? I want to pay you your money. And they went, you can't. Why not? Because your limited, your, your, your limited partnerships tax matters partner has already listed you in this lawsuit, and we are not going to speak to you until we settle this lawsuit. Mm. So 18 years later, wow, the lawsuit is finally settled. The partnership loses. Big surprise. And your $46,000 investment is now a $500,000 tax liability. Jesus. With compounding interest, what 18-year-old kid is going to know this? Sure. So I'm not blaming anybody. Look, I made my choices, but I learned the hard way. And when I became a financial advisor, all of these risk tolerability stress tests that you must put a client through mm-hmm. were written on the backs of people like me who were entered into these deals. And there is no recourse. It was bad advice. You took it. Right. 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 That's all it oh was, right? God. So, so there's been a lot, and I and I and thank God for all of these things happening to me. I mean, I I I've just I've learned so much, and whether this is so a perfect much. segue. So, so you've been through all this. You've had this great success. You've had this fall from grace. You've had this redemption. Where are you now? So you don't cruise, and you're you're done with cruising. That's done with over. The ships. Done with the ships. the ships. Why did you make that decision? I met, I met Winnie. <laughs> who, who, on the, who in their right mind would trade Monte Carlo for Winnie? <laughs> uh, you can have Monte Carlo all you want. I'll take Winnie. Thanks. I'll take my happiness. Thank you. Um, well, but you, well, you took Winnie with you quite a I bit. I did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you know, there is a point, you know, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of points in my career where people have said, you've had your day in the sun, there's no shame in, in quitting now. And I've just never felt that I was done. I always felt that I had more to say. Mm-hmm. And then the more life I lived with all of these experiences that I had, I really still feel as though I have something to offer. Mm-hmm. I have... I have real life experience now, not made up life experience, spending your life on a, on a film set where you're right. sheltered all the time. But I have real life experience. I, I know what it's like to, to be wealthy. Mm-hmm. I know what it's like to be homeless. Mm-hmm. I know what it's like to be revered. I know what it's like to be despised. Mm-hmm. I know what it's like to start my life over again and reinvent myself mm-hmm. because I must. And life isn't fair. I've never asked life to be fair. We have in our society the greatest opportunity in history, in humankind, to elevate ourselves above whatever our circumstances are. Some are more disenfranchised than others, but I can tell you without claiming, I have a sense of what it feels like to be completely disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. I have a sense of it. I can't Mm -hmm. compare it to other people's experience, which is far greater. Mm -hmm. But I do have a sense of what it feels like to be utterly and truly alone and know that no one is going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. And so I have a tremendous amount of empathy. And in building that, I mean, you, you, we kind of hinted around the, you know, my entire perspective, life perspective, I got into the ships and worked my way from entry level to three and a half stripe officer. I worked my way there. And guess what? Try explaining to somebody who grew up in communist Poland what eight is enough was. They don't give a shit what eight (laughs) is enough was. The only reason the crew knew I was famous is because the guests knew I was famous. Right, right. The rest of the wonderful thing about the ships, and I have the utmost respect for all of my, my seafaring colleagues, they are the hardest working, most true wonderful people on the planet. We had 47 nationalities, straight, gay, Jew, agnostic, Christian, 
you know, communist, Muslim, Hindu, and we all loved each other, respected each other, and got along daily, and they changed my life. No. I now can see the United States from the perspective of somebody who grew up in Brazil, or maybe they grew up in Cape Town, or maybe, mm -hmm. you know, there's a different awareness of mm -hmm. what's going on in the world. And mm -hmm. I still, I love the United States and I love, I love the people in the United States. But to a large extent, we've lost the plot. Mm -hmm. um, we've become a very inward looking country. If we don't have somebody we're fighting, we, we invent giants to slay. And, and, and if we don't have a giant to slay, then we turn on each other. And, and it, the most distressing thing about the last you know, few years to me is, you, know, you mentioned David Cassidy earlier and the reported last words of David were so much wasted time. Mm -hmm. And I've seen the world from so many different perspectives now. And I've, I've, I've stood on the bridge of a ship with an ex-Russian naval captain and laughed and, and, and had each other's back and, and supported one another. And I've, I've sat in the bazaars. I lived in Turkey for a while and spoke to you know, Muslim friends that I call brother about the differences between Christianity and, 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 and Islam. And and we still to this day hug each other. You know, there's no animosity there. Um, I, I've learned, you know, I, I've learned that I like languages. That experience on the ship was absolutely crucial to me being who I am today. Okay, so that's a perfect segue because we've been, I could talk to you all night long. Um, so where are you? To, so what does life look like today? I am living my best life. I'm 61 years old. I've never been happier. I've never been more in love. I've never been more creative. Um, my, my street writing has, has gotten noticed of some, some Academy Award winning producers. And, you know, you never, you can never count on being We're story. having some sound interference. I don't know what's happening. Oh, that's what that might be okay. me. Sorry. Okay. Um, having people that, are at the level of the people, and I, I don't want to be you know, name dropping, but mm -hmm. as a script writer and a storyteller, uh, as you know very well, the chances, even if you are well positioned, well placed, and well connected, of getting a script made are astronomically <laughs> small. Mm -hmm. So when you have somebody who takes something and reads it and deems it worthy, mm -hmm. that's the reward. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in my life, as a writer, I feel like an artist. I've never felt like an artist. I never thought I was a good actor. I was a mediocre actor, you know, on that, that got lucky with some good shows. I was never a great guitarist. I was never a great vocalist. You know, I was, I was famous, right? Let's, let's be honest, I was famous. But in order to create a script that was worthy of that kind of, of scrutiny, mm -hmm. I had to learn and earn it. I had to go back to the books. I had to learn formatting and structure and grammar. And I've spent the last five, six, seven years doing that. And I know that, you know, the chance. How, how did you do it, Willie? Did you, did you take classes? Did you do it online? What did you do? Did all of it. Mm -hmm. I bought books. I, I you know, I, I sent it out for coverage and got eviscerated. Just, just blood everywhere on the script. <laughs> You know, and, and determine, I had friends that were in high powered positions that could get them made. And I'd send them a script and I'd go, I will do this for you once, Willie, once. Okay. Right, Only right. because it's you. Right. And they'd read my script and they'd send it out for coverage and they'd come back and they'd slap it on the desk and go, ain't pretty, is it? <laughs> and I would start and I'd look at it and I was horrified and <laughs> so hurt and so upset. And then I, that grit would dig in and I'd go, I'm going to learn it. And now those same guys, you know, they're like, wow, look at the coverage for you. It's like, you know, recommend, recommend, recommend. And so I'm very proud of that. Um, today, I am very active in, in a number of spaces. Um, one is the Alzheimer's space. Uh, I work with a group of people who are, have been developing a, uh, a potential uh, treatment and vaccine for Alzheimer's. We are in uh, going into phase two human clinical testing on our first treatment. Uh, it's uh, connected to the University of South Florida. I'm extremely happy to be a part of that. 
What brought you to that? Well, I mean, my father passed from Alzheimer's, my mother-in-law. What brought you to Alzheimer's to have a passion? Well, my for grandfather uh, mm -hmm. was the first person. He was an English professor. He was the first person to prove that you could raise the IQ of a college freshman by teaching a course in semantics. And he taught that course at Whittier College for some 40 years. So he wrote a book called Design for Thinking. And he literally wrote the book on how to think, and he died of Alzheimer's. Uh, the oh, man who wrote the book on wow. how to think. Didn't think. Wow. And then we lost my grandmother to Alzheimer's, and, it, and you wow. know, it's been in our family. And um, a gentleman that I had met, you know, 35 years ago, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I was kind to him and gave him a, 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 a tour of the set at Universal and invited his family, and he disappeared for 35 years. Mm -hmm. And I got a, a Facebook spam message one day that said, hey, I've been trying to get a hold of you. You know, I, I was on the ships at that time. And, uh, and he said, uh, you know, will you call me? Actually, what had happened is I had bought a van from him. I bought a VW van from him. He goes, I sold you a VW van. Do you remember me? And I said, well, I've only bought one VW van, of course. And he said, I went to Wall Street and I became a, a hedge fund guy and made hundreds of millions of dollars and then fell apart in 2008, like you did. And I decided when I started over again, I was going to do something with my talents and skills for raising money to do something to make a difference. Mm -hmm. I've lost seven of my family members to Alzheimer's. I want to find a cure. And I want you to be my spokesperson. Wow. And I just burst out laughing. I was like, dude, I, nobody gives a shit what I do anymore. I mean, I can find you somebody who's really relevant, mm -hmm. you know? And he goes, no, 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 you're my guy. And I said, I am not your guy. Nobody cares what I do anymore. I mean, you know, he goes, well, I need some videos done. I said, that I can help you with. That I know how to do. And so I got involved that way. And I've been involved ever since for the last six years. And everybody said we couldn't do it. Everybody said it would never happen. And here we are in, in phase two clinical testing with our first Fantastic. potential treatment. And, uh, and so, you know, it's just been those things, you know, it was one of those things where kindness comes back uh, to you. And, um, and so I, I'm a big believer in that. And I have to say one of the things, one of the things I've been wanting to say is that, is that when I started over, what I decided, Vicki, was I was going to build out the bullshit. What does that mean? Well, I was going to have to rebuild my life. Mm -hmm. And if I was going to start over, I was going to get rid of anything that didn't resonate. If it wasn't good for my soul, if it wasn't kind, if it wasn't, uh, you know, it, 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 I look at the world today and the world thinks that everyone's entitled to your opinion mm. and they're not. Mm. Um, there are many things that I just don't say because it won't add to the greater good. Mm. And if I'm not going to add to your greater good, then why the hell would you want me around? I mean, I, I, I don't keep company with people who are toxic. I don't particularly think anybody's very interested in whatever the hell it is that I have to say. Who gives a shit, you know? So I, so I had a show. I did whatever. I, 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 I lend whatever talent I may or may ha not have left to projects that I think are uplifting and good and kind and, you know, to the haters and the people that, that you know, the gossips and the, the you know, all of this. I don't, if you look, Vicky, on my posts, I don't take shots at anybody. I don't post anything negative. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, hey, whatever your political beliefs are, you, you know, you, you're absolutely welcome to them. Privately, of course, I have very, very definite beliefs. Mm -hmm. But it's not up to me, you know, to, to uh, one thing that I've learned is that, is that we are all fragile. Mm -hmm. We are all breakable. Mm -hmm. We are all flawed. And me of all people have no right to judge you in whatever choices you're making. Mm -hmm. I can disagree with them, but privately is probably better. <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's come a long way for you, Willie, because I saw some footage of you and you were kind of a hotheaded, you, you were very outspoken, not always the nicest stuff coming out of your mouth back in those yeah. days. Yeah. So this is quite a journey that you've taken and it, reflects in your demeanor, your, your, uh, your love life, your, your career success. It's a lovely thing to see. It's very inspiring. Well, it's, you know, <laughs> Googling your own name and seeing that three or 4 million people think the world would be a better place if you didn't exist in it, you know, is, is pretty humbling. 
Wow. Um, and especially if you begin to believe them. Hmm. Uh, you know, I am the most fortunate man on the planet, uh, in my opinion. I have somebody that absolutely adores me. Who knows why? <laughs> um, my kids and my relationship with my kids are, have never been better. Fantastic. Um, I, you know, my, my son and I, and my daughter and I, uh, you know, are, are fully reconciled. Yeah. My did mother, you heal the relationship with your ex-wife? We, uh, uh, no. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, we both moved on and, mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, and, and there's no animosity, you know, outward an animosity or inward animosity for that mm -hmm. matter that, that mm -hmm. exists there. Um, it's just better that we both move on. Mm -hmm. um, there's some really difficult times and there's no point in, you know, looking backwards unless it's to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I've had to learn some very, very tough, dear lessons. You know, I, I live a very humble life. I don't live an extravagant life. Mm -hmm. I live, you know, very, you know, uh, uh, I don't want to say frugally, but it's humble. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, but it's fulfilling. I don't need much, um, you know, thank God my wife, you know, she, she's a, a champion of, you know, uh, we can live on love. And, uh, and so we make the decisions that are best for us uh, and our soul. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it's really important that you protect your soul. I see people that are so dedicated to online discourse that is just so negative mm -hmm. and and i i really fear for them in a lot of ways you know i think people who are in pain say and do things that they may not normally say and do and there's a lot of people in pain out there mm -hmm. and i understand pain i really do understand that pain mm -hmm. and i think that's why it, it's changed my life so much vicky is that you know um i've met people all over i have friends all over the world from all different backgrounds and and i've experienced it enough pain in my life and enough fortune in my life that I, I know which side of that I want to live on. You know, I want to be on the fortunate side. I don't want to live in the pain anymore. I don't want to live. I don't want to, I don't want to increase anyone else's pain. Mm -hmm. I have no desire to be somebody else's mechanism to inflict pain upon anyone else. No desire whatsoever. What purpose would it serve? You know, and, and so I try, try to stay positive. I, I don't always succeed, of course, but, but I try to stay positive, you know, and I, I try to try to be respectful. Well, I get that from you reading your daily posts and, and seeing your, uh, just watching who you are moving through the world. It was shocking for me to, to go back and see all that other stuff and see where you've come now. And as I said, extremely inspiring. And I love what you said about you practicing in your relationship and that you do it for you. And I'm, I'm going to take that forward with me. Thank you so, so much for doing this. Really. You are it's worth so waiting for. welcome. Thank you for, for just letting me waste everybody's time. No, all, no, no. All this three of them, whoever was watching. No, no, no. It, it was wonderful and, uh, and soul filling, soul filling. Well, uh, when I get back down to, you know, the, the, the crazy South and when, <laughs> COVID allows and when you're feeling better and I, and I'm, it's good to see you up. I thought about that. Oh, all of that, you know, all of that therapy. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. You know, out moving again. Um, when it, when it's, when it's possible, it would be a thrill to sit down and buy you a cup of coffee. I would love that. I would love that. And, and I love the fact, and I, I am so in awe of Winnie wanting a man who has women friends that well, are just friends. I love that. That awe is, is, is absolutely, uh, you know, well-deserved because mm -hmm. I am in awe of her daily. And that shows, and, that uh, shows, you know, well, happy. I think I get to say happy new year for another day or two. Oh, happy, sure. healthy, uh, COVID free new year to you both. And Thank you. I'm going to continue to watch your adventures and be inspired by them. Well, Thanks. you know, you, you got my personal number now. You there know, you, you can go. Just text me and go, you're losing it, buddy. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. Thank you so much, Willie. Thank you, Vicki. You have a great night. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye everybody.